let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into Hebrews chapter eleven. And uh, as I listened last week, and as we open often with review, I just uh, you know Brian and I always try try to find certain little opportunities to jab at each other. And I thought it was funny as he as he jabbed with me last week about uh, only covering and going so slow, and then he only got to one verse last week. So. I thank you for keeping on the on the good pace, bro. And uh, just wanted to say that out loud because I appreciate you and and uh, and all you do. And so um, we have a smaller group here tonight, but uh, I'm just very thankful and grateful, uh, you know, just to be a part of a, certainly a church like this that has such a desire to uh, read and study God's word. Uh, but certainly, fellow pastors that uh, are dedicated to to really studying the word truthfully, trying to you know, handle it uh, the way that God's called us to handle it. And, you know, you guys know that we're not in any timeline or schedule to get through and burn through things. We're trying to deepen the well. We're trying to, you know, help one another grow in these things. And certainly with the Holy Spirit as our teacher, uh, you know, continue to deepen that well and uh, and grow more in the knowledge of God. And so uh, I'm, I'm just grateful for uh, for you, Brian, and for, you know, the, the giftness that God's given you and for the gift that it is to, to the church. So thank you. So, um, with that out of the way, I'm also grateful for you. So, so thank you uh, always for, for all your faithfulness in God's Word and, and our discussion time and all the things that, uh, that the Lord is doing to sharpen them, each, each one of us. So, as we get to chapter 11, um, what do you guys think about? Uh, what, what specifically has chapter 11 been about? I know we've been camped out here for a few months now uh, as it's been taking some time to get through it. And, and why is that? Why has it taken so long? What, what have we t- been talking about? faith good yeah chapter 11 certainly about faith and so man that seems like it shouldn't take us that long to talk about right we get a definition there in verse one and so okay we hear what faith is okay we got that we know what faith is and then we can move on right but what have we been talking about what has the author been been doing how, how what has been his approach here of of how uh you know what he's saying about faith what is what is he doing examples of faith okay yeah. Two different uh, people. Okay, good. Examples of faithful uh, people and, and men and women, right? Because up to, to this point, as we finished, I think, verse 30 um, last week, um, 31, and you guys were talking about uh, the walls of Jericho, right, and, and Rahab, and so we, we talked about her. And then we have also talked about uh, Rebecca, or excuse me, uh, Sarah earlier in the chapter also. And so we've seen these two women listed. And so interesting, right, as Pastor Brian was pointing out last week, that uh, Rahab is only the, the second, you know, the second woman listed here. There's only two ladies mentioned here in this hall of faith. And Rahab, this harlot, this prostitute uh, from a pagan uh, land of Canaan there and a Jericho there, is, is the other one. And so you guys uh, finished off last week, I think, talking about the significance of that, right? Because uh, Pastor Brian took you to Matthew 1 into the genealogy of, of the Messiah. And lo and behold, whose name's in that line? Rahab, right? This, this uh, prostitute, this Gentile prostitute who was kind of the spies and uh, understanding, obviously, by God's providence, her and her family were saved. Uh, from destruction there, and God called her to marry, uh, you know, this man Salmon, uh, or Salmon, and, you know, they have a child, and his name is Boaz, and then another, in that next genealogy, the next step there is that Boaz marries Ruth, and if you're familiar with the, the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, that's that Ruth, and she is a Moabite, and so, oh man, this is just spiraling into all kinds of thoughts. Ruth is a Moabite, and anyone remember where the Moabites come from? So we, we talked about this in service in Genesis 19. Uh, but the daughters of Lot, you guys remember what happened after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? What happened when Lot and his daughters were kind of in the cave and on their own? Remember what happened there? Yeah. What happened there? They basically slept with their father. Yeah, and not basically, right? Yeah. They said, hey... Uh, there's no other men for, for us to, to carry on, you know, our name here and to have children. And so let's get our father drunk and have children with him. And so they each take turns getting him drunk 
one night and saying that, you know, it says that he did not know what they were doing. And although he was getting drunk, which you're not, you're not supposed to be doing. So, uh, but the point of it being that uh, out of this incestual crazy thing uh, comes uh, one son who is Moab, who becomes the lineage of the Moabites. And the other one is of the Ammonites. And these are, you know, regarded later as enemies of Israel. And the Moabites, that's where the Moabites come from. And so a Moabite that came from that uh, situation is also in the lineage of the Messiah. So, like, you can't even write these things. Like, if, if men were to be over thousands of years or hundreds of years having conspiracy to write these things, like, no one would, this is not how the story would go. So we have a prostitute who was married and saved by God, and then their son ends up marrying a Moabite that came back from the situation with Lot, uh, and then, you know, and then Boaz and Ruth have a child named Obed, and Obed has a son named David, who's going to be the king, right? We know a lot about David, and through his lineage will come the Messiah, comes Jesus. So all that to say, the significance of, of Rahab is not small, right? That God used her uh, in this line of, of Jesus and to do great things. And so uh, by faith, you know, she, she was saved by the Lord. And so, and really, isn't that a, a universal statement? Anyone who's saved by the Lord is saved how? By faith, right? And so as we go down this hall of faith, um, you know, we think, oh, these, these men and women are so great and so obedient and so faithful to God. And, and yes, I would say that there are times in their lives where they were. But then we also know that they're human, just like us. And so whoever the name is that we go back there, oh, by faith, Noah. Well, we know things about Noah and his sinfulness, right? By faith, Abraham. Well, we know things about Abraham. By faith, David. Yeah, we know a lot of things about David that show they're sinful men and women just like us. And so, uh, you know, our names are written, right, in, in the book uh, if we're saved. And so uh, by faith, uh, we are all saved. So, you know, it's only by his grace. And so that's what we see here. And, and so remember, what's, what's the point, I guess, of the emphasis of this? Why is the author, you know, writing these things? Why is he writing 40 verses here? Which, understand, obviously the verse numbers weren't there when he wrote it. Uh, but he's going on for quite some length here to talk about these, these men and women. So what do you think is the point of all that? Why would he use that? What's his, why is that his strategy? trying to get a point across that by faith is what we're trying to do. I mean, that's the point. If that's what we need is faith, and that's the examples of that. Good. Yeah, because again, remember, who's, who's it seems is the primary audience? Hebrews. Hebrews, okay. Uh, you know, Israelites, Jews, right? And so with that being said, they have the baggage, if you will, of the old covenant, right? And so... How does that maybe expound a little bit, maybe, of where I didn't have an answer for my question. Sometimes they just pop out of my mouth. So, you know, how can we expound on that a little bit, maybe, to say why would he be giving all these examples of these people then, understanding that's his audience and the baggage they have? How, what's he trying to, to do? I think um, possibly... Possibly by the by the Old Testament, by the Old Covenant, it was more out of discipline than it was faith. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, can't you, and we see that in religion today, don't we? Like, can't you just go through ceremonies and traditions and, and things like that without faith? Really? I mean, can't you just go through the motions and do the practices? You can, but it won't get you anywhere. Yeah, that's right. And, and boom, there's the answer. That's what he's saying, right? All those things that you guys know of, that you've always done and practiced, all that was is null and void now because there's a new covenant and it's in the blood of Christ, the sacrifice, the high priest, right? The greater messenger with the greater message, all the things that we've seen. And so I think that's exactly the point. I get the feeling, you know, if I'm a Hebrew and we're through this letter in chapter 11, I have this sense that, oh, you're, 
you're stripping away something from me that was so integral, so valuable, so part of our society and culture. But this is, is a way really to say, well, yes, I certainly am emphasizing the superiority of Christ in the New Covenant, but there's a sense in which I'm taking nothing away because, look, all of your forefathers were saved like this. So it, it, there's a sense in which it's not new at all. Right. And so you, you can relate. You can still keep it very close to your chest. It can still be something very integral and valuable as a part of who you are as a Jew, an Israelite. Yep. Yep, good point. Because he's pointing out the new covenant makes the old obsolete, right? But the point is, to, to Brian's point, that it was always obsolete. That it was never, to what Shannon was saying, it was never the means of salvation. That all those things without faith were, like you said, accomplishing nothing. They weren't doing anything. Everybody uh, took the sacrifices. Everybody offered up the sacrifices and took the lambs to the, to the priest. Everybody tried to obey the commands. Everybody did this. Everybody did that. I think of 1 Corinthians 10. We went through that study of how it talks about all of them were baptized uh, with Moses, you know, through the through the wilderness, and and all of them were fed the manna, right, which was the spiritual food, and which uh, was the, where it tells us that the rock was Christ, the rock that followed them around in the wilderness was Christ, and that they all did this, they all did this, and then remember what it says, and yet they all perished, not all of them made it in, very few of them made it in, that they all died outside of the promised land and outside of Christ, and so yeah, all the things that you did, they 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 meant nothing with without faith. Good. Well, they're also misusing it, like the manner when they say storing it and stuff, it was being misused because of their lack of faith. Yeah. Because it's like, it comes every day, but is it going to be tomorrow? I don't know, we'll save some anyway. And then it's like, yeah. you know. Uh, there's some application there, right? I feel <laughs> there's some application for me as you said that. Yeah. Yeah, because I just, I feel like too often I try to do things on my own. And, and though I have faith and though I'm saved, I still uh, struggle with the absolute reliance and recognition in every moment, you know, and just and just feeling like, yep, uh, I know you're giving to me the manna every day, uh, but, uh, you know, I didn't thank you for the manna today and I'm trying to hoard some up for tomorrow because I'm just, I'm just, I want to be prepared and I just don't know, you know, and it's like, no, you're supposed to, you're supposed to know by faith and you know, you're supposed to obey <laughs> and be grateful and all the things that we know to do, and yet I still struggle to do it. Good. Okay, so let's, uh, let's pick up in our text then in verse 32. And we only got through to 40, so let's, let's just read the, the rest of it if somebody can, uh, can do that for us here tonight. Thirty-two at the end. Yes, sir. Thank you. And what more shall I say? For time would fail. <clears throat> excuse me. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the power of fire. Escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they may they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. 
Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for the spirit. Thank you for this text. Thank you for this amazing gift of salvation. Uh, Lord, by faith through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we uh, come through this section and this teaching on faith, pray that you would grow us in ours, uh, in our understanding of, of the things that you have uh, and the truths of your word, that we would put it to, into practice in our, in our lives and that we would be changed uh, to be more like you and more effective for your causes. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, back to verse 32. <clears throat> so we've seen some amazing things, and we've gone through each one of these, and you know, gone back into the Old Testament accounts and unpacking uh, the, these accounts of the Old Testament narrative that we see. And so now, <clears throat> uh, last week we came through, you know, uh, the the walls of Jericho falling, and and uh, the leadership there under Joshua and the conquest. And as I say that, I think it might have been two weeks ago, uh, where I kind of. I kind of got on a, a little tangent that's coming back to my brain right now. Uh, you know, the Old Testament narrative. Remember I was talking about how we need to be uh, more solid in our understanding of the Bible. That's why we study. That's why we continue to put the work in. Uh, is that we need to, to not only, uh, first and foremost, we should be able to articulate the gospel to people, right? And giving the, the workings of the gospel and the, the highlights of the gospel so that we can say it in a way uh, that, that God may use it to, to save people. Uh, but then also, as we continue to grow in our sanctification, we're putting pieces of the puzzle together and so that we can form you know, intelligent conversations and understandings about the Old Testament you know, and about the New Testament. And so we kind of went through those things, and I say it again because I see it here again now. We're getting to an awesome uh, thing here tonight of all these statements that they say here. But look, it starts there with Gideon, Barak, and Samson, Jephthah. And so those four, anybody know those four names or anything about them or, or who, who they were or, or what time frame uh, they were in or anything like that? We're going to get into it, but I'm just asking a question just to see, uh, you know, make my point to get to, to where I'm trying to go, I guess. Do we know anything about that? Who is Gideon or Samson? We might know all about Samson, right? What do you guys think about Samson? Jawbone of a donkey? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Strong, right? Samson, Delilah, and, and so we'll, we'll get into that here shortly, but they're judges, okay? Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, those are four of the judges, and so um, I went through, and actually I sent you guys a text the next day because when I got home that night, I texted Rob because I left out one of the, one of the things, and it was bothering me, and I didn't want to send it out at 1030 at night, uh, but, and Brian, you should have been there because you could have maybe helped me. You weren't there that night, Brian. I uh, botched fault. it. So I'm blaming it on you. It's all your fault, okay? Uh, but no, to, to come through the narrative of, you know, say creation, and then we move from creation. Remember, we have the patriarchs. That's where we are in Genesis right now with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Uh, and then from the patriarchs, we go to, uh, you know, the Exodus and Moses. And so uh, we, we get into that narrative. Then after Moses, who's the leader after Moses of, of Israel? Joshua. Yep, Joshua. We spoke about him in earlier chapters and how uh, Jesus is a better leader into a better promised land than Joshua. Uh, but that's called the conquest. Joshua comes in and conquers all these lands, and, and Israel takes the land that is the promised land uh, that they were told some like 450 years earlier that it would be theirs, and now it's time to get it. And Joshua takes them into there, and, and that's what happens. Then after that, we have the time of the judges. Then we have the time of the kings. Then after that, there is a time that we call the exile or captivity, where Israel is in captivity for 70 years uh, in Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the, the story you can read through in Daniel and um, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and, and that, that, that narrative there. Uh, then after the exile, we have the restoration and, and where God brings them back into the land. Those are kind of the, the, that's kind of the construct of how it's made up. And I say that to say this. Look, look at this chapter as I was studying it week in and week out. It started with back with Abel and Enoch, right? And so Abel is right there after Adam and creation. We get to Enoch. We get to Noah. Uh, you know, we get to this time coming here now, the patriarchs, when we get to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, right? We're coming right through now in, into the patriarchs. Then after that, who do we see? Moses. Here's the Exodus. You see what I'm saying? He's going all through. There's Moses with the Exodus uh, I'm just going down here quickly looking at my underlining. Who's, who's next? Crossing the Red Sea. Then the walls of Jericho last week with Rahab. 
What was that? That was the conquest in the times of Joshua. Now we get into verse 32, and here's Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah. Here's the judges. And then look who's named after that. David. Who was he? A king. So there's the kings and the prophets, and then it's going to go right through to the end there. So the overarching point, I guess, that I'm trying to get to, if there is one here, is the author here is taking us all throughout the entirety of of creation to the day in which he's writing. So he's spanning with this list of, of these people in the Hall of Faith from the beginning right up until where he currently is to say it's always been by faith. <laughs> it's always been throughout all these different eras that we just talked about, these different ages that we're talking about. And up to this point where this is being written is in the first century so we're talking some 4,000 years after creation. So he's saying there's a lot of history here. There's a lot of things here. And here's just a recap of all those eras. And every one of them, it's always been the same. There's a God who's gracious, who by faith has granted to people salvation and life and belief in him and the Messiah who he will send. And now this writer's looking back on it saying the Messiah is Jesus whom he sent that accomplished this plan of redemption. You see it? So that's kind of like the big picture. There's the flyby overview of the big picture of what we see in, uh, in chapter 11. Does that make sense? you guys have any questions or thoughts about that before we kind of dig into these verses? Okay. Yeah, and you don't have to. Just uh, That's just off the cuff in the brain coming as I look at this and study this. That's definitely what was sticking out a lot to me the last couple weeks. Good. So now we get into some of those judges. Let's, let's look at it. Gideon. Uh, turn back to Judges chapter 6. Anybody know anything about Gideon? Know how recently you've read Judges? I know some of you actually are in the reading plan. It's got a Bible out. Huh? It's got a Bible out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, he, he's the guy that puts, ho uh, puts Bibles in the hotel uh, in the hotel drawers. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this Gideon. Yeah, we don't have to read the whole accounts here, but does does anyone remember or recall anything? What do we know about this this judge? So, the Bible tells us that in the times of the judges, it says that every man did what was right in his own sight. Okay, so uh, there was a lot of anarchy, a lot of uh, sinfulness, a lot of wickedness going on. And then God raised up these judges to kind of do exactly that, to judge the people and to hold them accountable and kind of be the leader, if you will, uh, during this time of this area that we refer to as the judges. In fact, look at verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay, so, um, and, and we see that's a reoccurring theme, right, all throughout the Old Testament. So, uh, Look down about verse 11. You might have a heading there in your Bible. Mine says, the call of Gideon. Okay, so uh, it says in verse, 20, uh, verse 12, excuse me. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, Gideon, and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if, it, if the Lord is with us, uh, why then has all this happened to us? Right? So he's saying, hey, if we're God's people, like, why, why is all these bad things happening to us? Okay, where, where's God right now? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Okay, so we see here now the enemy that he's referring to are the Midianites. Okay, and the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours to save Israel from the hand of Midian. Did, uh, do, I, excuse me, do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord. How can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So he's saying, look, man, <laughs> I, I don't know, Lord, why you've left us, but I see no evidence that you are with us uh, as the, the enemies are taking us down. Uh, you have forsaken us, he's saying, and God is saying, I have not forsaken you. I am going to use you. And he says, I'm nobody. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, and in fact, I think of 1 Samuel, uh, where uh, Samuel talks to the Lord, and the Lord provides Saul 
uh, to be the first king of Israel, and it's the same principle. That Saul's the least from the smallest, from the weakest, and so that seems to be something that could be, could be a, a pattern here, a principle of the Lord. Uh, think of David, the next king of Israel, and as, as uh, Samuel went to Jesse's house, David's father, and God said, hey, from this house, will, I will bring the next king up. Saul is no longer to be the king, but the next king will be from this house. And as uh, Jesse parades his, I think, eight of his sons of his in front of Samuel, you know, Samuel thinks this first one is huge, big, strapping, handsome, strong guy and thinks this is the guy. And, and the Lord says, no, that's not the guy. And, and that's where we hear and find out that it says, you know, God doesn't have eyes like we do, right? That God does not look at the outward appearance like man does, but he looks at what? The heart, right? And so then he goes, oh, what about, you know, are these all your sons? Oh, what about the shepherd boy out there? Oh, bring him in because we're not going to, we're going to stop everything and not do anything until you bring that one in. And God says, yep, that's the one. And so again, the, the least likely, not the one who you would expect to be. And so uh, there's definitely, I think, that principle we see all through the scriptures, all through the scriptures. Uh, think of uh, pray, uh, thanking God for hiding things from those who are, uh, you know, wise and, and revealing it to the babes, to the infants, you know, is Jesus' words uh, speaking to the Father. So uh, there, there is something to that, okay? So in that we see that, that he is of the least of, of them, and, uh, and yet you'll go on to, to read it. If you don't know the whole account, you can certainly read it in, in your own um, study time there. But 32,000. Okay, we'll find out in chapter 6 and chapter 7. There's 32,000 men that show up to fight with Gideon against the Midianites. The Midianite army will be 135,000 strong. Okay, uh, we'll find out, I think, in chapter 8. It's either 7 or 8. Chapter 8, uh, that it says, left of that army, there had fallen 120,000 and there was 15,000 men left. So that's how we know there's 135,000 people, men, in this Midianite army, and 32,000 Israelites show up for Gideon. So maybe this is sparking some memories. Anybody remember what happens, though? Do, do they go? That's, that doesn't seem like good odds, right? Uh, Brian, Air Force guy, military guy, right? W what's our odds there? 32,000 against 135,000. Yeah, you'd have to analyze you know, what the weapons were like. And if you had superior weapons, you may go with a you know a two to one odd if you had overwhelming firepower or something. But uh, this seems like what five to one, <laughs> and I'm, I'm guessing the technology was similar. So it's probably unacceptable risk from a war making standpoint. So not good odds, Pete. Same thing. Another another I'm army doing a 135 uh, team. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and so help me recall what happens. Anybody know more of the story? What happens? Is it going to be 32,000 against 135,000? No. What happens? It keeps whittling it down. Yeah. God says, you know what? You're right. You know what, Pete, Brian, you're right. This is unacceptable. These aren't good numbers. This is not right. This is not good. So let's take care of that. And how he does is he says, well, go ahead and tell the, the people who are scared, anyone, any man who's scared and doesn't want to fight, let them leave. And I don't remember the number. Maybe you can look it up real quick in there. Yeah, it went from... Um, I think 10,000 20, remained. Yeah, 22,000 returned. <laughs> so he says, anyone who doesn't want to fight or is fearful can leave, and 22,000 leave. So now we've got 10,000 against 135,000. And God says again, yeah, you're right. Those odds, Pete, are not good. Th those still aren't right odds for, for this war. And so he dwindles the number down to who remembers? How, how many? 300. 300. <laughs> okay. So I want us to understand, though, that these are God's numbers, right? And so he says, yeah, you know what the acceptable number is going to be? It's going to be 300 against 135,000. Because for his glorification, it's not food. I love it. Answering before I even get the question out. Mm -hmm. There you go. Right? In this, we see that when I hand the Midianites over to you, you will know that what? That I am the Lord. Yeah, that I am the Lord and that this was not of you. Uh, and so I'm going to take those men that lapped up the water like the dog, because that's how he 
whittled down the rest of them was they all went to the water and he had a, some of them kneeled down and scooped the water up right paying attention and looking and others just bent down like a dog and lapped it and he said let's take the dog lappers and we'll take those 300 and we're going to go take these guys out and so god gets all the glory but we see this account in hebrews 11 why why does Gideon then make this list? Well, it was it was by faith the three hundred. Then, I mean, like you said, if if they're kneeling down, drinking water with their hands, looking at everything, you know, watching their back, they don't have the faith. But if they're hands down, you know, then they have they have faith in what they're trying to accomplish. Okay. Good, because by faith, right? We know that's, that's what every one of them says. So by faith, by faith, by faith. So Gideon is there because of his faith and because he was called and he was the least and he had all these reasons. I think of Moses who was listening there, same thing. Lord, I can't speak. They won't listen to me. I don't know. And yet God lifts him up and, and uses him to do great things. And so we see that he's in here because of his faithful acts, right? Because he was faithful uh, to God, who is faithful, and he's the one who promised and said he would deliver him, and he said, okay, then that's enough for me, and I'll do it. And so there we see the faith of Gideon. Okay, let's look at the next one. Barak, or Barak, and actually, this isn't in chronological order in Hebrews, because that happens before this. So go back to Judges chapter 4. This is an interesting one. Because, and, and this is interesting too, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. And the people of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Isn't that what verse 1 of chapter 6 just said? <laughs> Same exact thing, okay? So, and that's how it goes after each one of these, you guys. Uh, I think uh, Othniel, Caleb's brother, was the first one, but then there was, uh, he, he did well, and it says, uh, I'm looking back in chapter 3, verse 11. It says that Othniel did well, and the Lord gave him some, some victories, and it says the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel died, and guess what happened? Next verse. The people of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So then he lifts up a new judge and, and judges people and does well, and guess what? Ehud, that one dies, and guess what happens after the leader dies? Verse 1, and Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. Like, you see, you see the pattern? And so in chapter 4... Uh, he raises up someone, and it's some ones. If you look at verse 4, it says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, and that's interesting. So why don't we just get a thought on that? You know, it's, it's especially as I think of New Testament teachings, and we often hear conversations in the church so much today about uh, can women be pastors, can women be, uh, you know, teachers and have places of authority in the church, and so... Uh, th those are definitely big conversations, and so maybe we have a little discussion right here. Um, these are definitely discussions that Brian and Steve and I have had many occasions. So what do we think about this? Deborah, a prophetess, what does that even mean? And what are the implications of that? Or are there any? Well, a female prophet is useful. Okay, a female prophet, yep. I think especially back then, it's, it's hard enough now, but especially back then, you know, to, to even consider anything that a woman would say, mm -hmm. you know. Good. Yeah. So, yeah, I would say, yeah, it seems prophetess, right, is it would be the female prophet like, like um, Peter Sand. However, I would say, uh, you know, caveat may be that when we think of prophets and we think of, say, Elijah, right, or, or a prophet like that, and we see that he is the mouthpiece of God for, like, a long period of time and through through certain circumstances of, of history and, and, you know, going against King Ahab and Jezebel and just all the things that we know he went through. Whereas we don't get much on Deborah. This is what we hear here. And so Deborah being called a prophetess, I would say to you, simply means that the Lord spoke through her, that the Lord used her to speak to Barak here and to speak to these men here 
And so it doesn't mean that this was a reoccurring thing or that she was a prophet for 50 years. Um, it just simply means that God chose to use her as a vessel to speak to his people. Does that make sense? And I think also it's worth emphasizing, as you have alluded to, the, the Bible clearly uh, establishes different roles for men and women throughout, beginning to end. Mm -hmm. But there's exceptions to everything. Uh, just because Deborah was a judge doesn't mean that's the norm, doesn't mean that's the standard, doesn't mean that's God's perfect way to set things up. Uh, just like it wasn't um, the norm or perfect for David to be an adulterer with uh, Bathsheba and to have her husband killed. I mean, that's not just because David did those things, we don't model after him and yeah. doing that. Just because a donkey talked one time, that's not the normal. We don't, we're not looking for talking donkeys every time now. That one episode doesn't, you know, fuel what is normal. So God could do anything, anytime, anyhow he wants it. This does seem to be an exception, and I think the exception mm -hmm. is alluded to, you know, say in verse 8, when Barak, the military guy, said to her, if you'll go with me, I will go. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> You know, so I think it gives insight into the strongest man on campus is so weak that he won't go unless the woman goes with him. So yes. I think it paints a picture Me too. of the exception to the rule on, on, on the people were sinning and just not following God's plan. And God said, yes. okay. That was I'll definitely my thought process also. And even the <clears throat> commentaries that I read and you know, things that I saw was, yeah, that he... Uh, judging, in fact, you know, the men. Judging the men by using a woman to say, uh, you, need to, you need to wisen up, you need to wake up here. And, and now Barak, after this, does end up going through and obeying God, but it even says, to his point, um, look at the next verse following, look at 9. And she said, after this, she said, go and do it. And then he says, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. Then verse 9 she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, so here's the judgment that's coming upon this because of, because of you. The road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera, and this is uh, the leader, the king, the, the commander of the, the enemies at this, at this point, uh, who are the Canaanites. says, the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And so going right to Brian's point, She's saying, yep, we're going to go, and we're going to go do this, and the Lord's going to do it, but yet you will receive no credit for this. Uh, in fact, everyone will know that he's going to be killed by a woman, and that you were... It, it, here's the irony of it to me, I guess. The, the awkwardness here is we're talking about the lack of faith that we see in Barak and these men, but yet in Hebrews 11, Barak's listed for his faith. So again, we go back to the humanity of good day, bad day. Faithful, yes. Failure, yes. And, and, and we don't have the whole account here, but we know Barak's named in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And so he is faithful and he does follow through and he does do this. Uh, but we, found that we find out later that uh, he pursues this sister. And look, it says uh, in verse 17, Sisera fled away on foot, so they, tr they traced him down and, and followed him. And it says he went to the tent of jail, the wife of Heber the Kenite. So this jail comes out, and, and this man, Sisera, is trying to hide. And so he goes into this tent. She says, here, you can hide in, in, my, in my tent. And, and he's like, yes, keep me in here until they go by. He falls asleep. She takes a tent peg and drives the thing right through his temple and kills the man. Boom. Stuck it. Just saw it. Right through the temple, right to the ground, it says. Uh, verse 21. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground. Bam! Woman killed him. You didn't kill him. And, and so that was kind of, again, what, what Brian was alluding to, saying that, yes... Uh, this was a different occasion where we have Deborah acting with Barak 
and, and speaking to Barak from God. And then we see God, uh, you know, not giving all the glory to Barak for his lack of faith to just go and do it. But yet, we still know that Barak was faithful and obedient and did go to accomplish the mission. Make sense? Thoughts? Or, or on any of the application, too, that, that Brian spoke to. And so I think, it's, I think he said it well. Okay. All right, we, we still got plenty of time. Let's go to the next one. Uh, Samson, next one. Let's go to Judges chapter 13. We find him in 13 to 16. And somebody give some highlights. This is a more popular uh, one of the judges, right? And so what do we know about Samson? I know a corny dad joke slash pastor joke, uh, which... It's already ruined the punchline, but it's um, what kind of cell phone did Delilah use? Samson. See, I told you it was corny. I told you it was a, a pastor joke. So I thought I heard that from Hawkins. I heard that from some 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 comic. But Samson, what do we know about him besides Delilah or about Delilah? <clears throat> she cut his hair. Okay. Yep, we got that part of it. Why did she cut his hair? That's where his strength. strength was. Okay, so, well, let's clarify that. Is his hair where his strength came from? No, it was, it was. Ah, see what I'm saying? God, yeah. God said, you'll be strong if you don't cut your hair. And his mom never cut his hair. And then that's, in line, that's what he thought his strength was, was his hair, not his faith. Okay. So what do we call that? It's a type of vow. Anyone remember? Anyone know? The not cutting of hair. Actually, we talked about it in our Acts study, but that's been a few years now, that, because Paul did it as well on one of his journeys, where it said he didn't cut his hair for a time, and then he did. And it talks about this in, in the law also. Look down, uh, it's in here somewhere at the beginning of the chapter. Nazarite. Yes, yes. verse 5. Yeah. Behold, you will conceive and bear a son, and he says, that God says to, to these parents here, says that you shall, uh, a razor shall not come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall uh, begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. So this is interesting. Another judge, another people to type. We saw the Midianites getting in defeats. We saw Deborah and Barak defeat Canaanites. Now we see Philistines, all enemies of Israel, right? Remember these conquests that God is judging them and, and conquering them. So, yeah, that's called a Nazarite vow, that you would not cut your hair uh, for an extended amount of time, and it would be kind of like similar to like fasting, we might be a little bit more familiar with, uh, that they would take vows and they would do these things for specific times and try to draw nearer to the Lord. But all that to say, yeah, he didn't get his it wasn't like Popeye and ate his spinach and that gave him strength, right? It wasn't long hair that gave him the strength. Right. It was his faith and it was the Lord that gave him the strength to do, I mean, mighty awesome things. I think about one time where it says that he went into the city and he was, he was mad at them. And it says that he lifted up the bars and the gate of the city on his shoulders and just walked down the street and just took, took them away. He didn't open the gate. He didn't break the gate down. He lifted the, the foundation of the gates under the bars and everything and just walked off with them like shoulder press. Um, so, so many things. The, the one, uh, Brian's favorite one he was talking about. What happened to that incident, Brian? He opened up a can with the junk <laughs> on the talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, he, wasn't, he wasn't supposed to touch anything dead. Good. That's part of the Nazarite vow, yeah. right? No touching yeah. dead things. Uh, I think of the time where he uh, he did see there was a dead lion. Yeah, there was a dead lion, but then he came back, and bees had made a hive in it. There was some honey, so he took some of the honey and ate of it. Uh, think of he was married. So that's what I was going to say. What was Samson's Achilles heel there? Lust. Yes, women, right? He, he wanted to get married, so he goes to marry a woman, and... Um, that woman you gave me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he goes to, uh, to, to marry a woman, and 
they go to have the, the festival and the feast to get married, and she is a Philistine, and so that's not good, right? And But he's going to marry this woman, and so uh, at the at the ceremony, at the feast, all her relatives are saying, hey, they make like a bet is kind of what happens, and so he says to them, oh, I'll tell you this riddle, and if you can tell me the answer to the riddle, I'll give you, I think it was 30 changes of garments. And so... They get three days to answer it. He gives it. It's about the lion and the honey. And so uh, he gives them three days to answer it, and they can't answer it. And third day comes, but they they start bugging the wife now. Find out the answer. Find out the answer. Find out the answer. She goes and she prods and she finds out the answer. She tells her relatives, and they come and they answer. And Samson knows that she's betrayed him and says, yeah, uh, <laughs> the lion there, right? If You would not have known if you didn't plow with my heifer. <laughs> That's what he says, <laughs> right? Something to that degree. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have known my thing unless you plowed with my heifer. Like, I know what you did. Uh, and so then he goes, and he goes and beats down 30 guys out there, just takes all their clothes and brings them back and gives the garments to the guys, okay? So uh, so this is how he uses his strength in different ways. And then to, to Brian's point, they, they go and they say, uh, then he later, <laughs> this is, Man, this story, it just, it's a never-ending. Awesome. Like, this is, this is a soap opera. This will be a good miniseries, okay? That after that, he, the father of the bride gives the bride away to the best man. Yeah. So he takes the bride and gives her to the best man. And when Samson comes back to say, like, hey, where's my bride? She, he, the father says, oh, I thought you hated her, so I gave her to another guy. And why don't you take her sister? She's more beautiful. And so this makes Samson mad. He goes and he takes how many foxes? 300. Thank 300. you. 300 foxes, takes them and ties them by the tails and ties a torch to each one of their tails and sets them free in all, the, in all their land and all their fields. And so he sets all their fields on fire. And so then they come to Israel and the leaders of Israel come down to Samson and say, dude, what are you doing? Like you're killing us. You're making all the enemies mad. And let us bind you and turn you over to them. And so he says, okay, just promise me that you won't kill me yourself. And so they bind him, they turn him over, and here's where Brian's story comes in. Because it says he breaks through those things like it was flax or like it was nothing. He rips out of there and he finds a jawbone of a donkey and he slays and kills a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. So it says, and each one of these times, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So where did his strength come from? From the Lord. Yeah, from the Lord. But we often think of the Samson and Delilah thing, and again, his weakness, the, the woman. And so he does give in to that. She does cut his hair, but to, to Shannon's point, you know, it's the ups and downs that we see in Samson's life, which is typical, right? Which is applicable. Because we see his feats of faith and his strength that he has in the Lord, but then we see his constant failure, right? His anger, his lack of acting godly, right? His outbursts, all these things that his actions and the attitudes don't always line up with what they should. And so again, we see his humanity. And so in the Samson Delilah one, go, somebody recap that for us. What what happens there? What's the outcome there? You guys know? You guys know the story, right? What happens? Because she's asking him what? What's she trying to find out? Secret of your strength. For the Philistines, right? The enemies want to know, why is this guy so strong? Why can't we get this guy? Yeah, yeah so she keeps asking and asking and asking and asking. To where finally it just said he couldn't take it anymore. And just told her, right? And so they, they bind him. But then even in this, in his death, what happened? Yeah, so feats of strength. All these Philistines are there and they're partying because they caught this guy and they put him on show there. They've poked his eyes out, he can't see, and they've tied him to post inside the, or, you know, put him near post in there. And he says, Let me lean on the post of the house. And he prays to God right then with short hair and all, right? And says, Lord, you know, let me use my feats of strength one more time, you know, and essentially by faith for, his, for God's glory. Uh, he defeated more Philistines, I think it says, in his death than he did in his lifetime. Uh, right there, as he pulled the house down on himself, he killed all those Philistines. And, and God conquered them in that. And so again, 
Can't you just see it in Samson there, the ups and downs of life, right? And yet, here we see again, he's listed in the Hall of Faith for his faithfulness. So, he certainly shows um, great faith and courage, you know, in spite of his struggles and the things that he, that he went through. Good evening, guys. There you go. Good, good. So you made it in safe. Right. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Hey, Sanjay. <laughs> so, anyone else find, you know, application in, in that? We've got, uh, we've got 10 minutes here. We could certainly probably move on to Jephthah uh, in 10 minutes. So, good to see you, Sanjay. Um, so, yeah, ups and downs. Faithfulness, and yet just total lack of, you know, pursuing a godly life and and that's uh, all through these that have been listed in Hebrews 11 it's the same thing right and I think I certainly find in my life it's the same thing okay let's move through uh, to Jephthah maybe we can get through all these judges here tonight we'll pick up uh, in with King David next week judges chapter 11 This one's a really interesting one, and we don't even have to get into all the details. But here's another, here's another group. We're now with the Ammonites, and another judge that's been lifted up. And as you look back at, look back at verse 6 of chapter 10, again, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So now the Ammonites have been raised up in our enemies of Israel. Verse 1 of chapter 11 says, Jephthah, the Gideonite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Okay, so, um, again, with the a, a least or lesser likely uh, hero of the story, but yet it's the ones that God chooses uh, to serve him and to be an instrument for him. And so Jephthah, anybody know anything? What do we know about Jephthah? We know that it just said he's a mighty warrior. That's good. That's a pretty good prerequisite, right, for going to fight the enemy. Verse 29 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, same as it says about Samson, same as it says about these others. And so we see uh, that Jephthah is is used by God to judge the Ammonites, and he does defeat them. The crazy thing about Jephthah's uh, story is that he makes a vow. Look down at verse 30. Because this reminds me of our study, what was it, of James, saying not to make vows, right? And we talked a lot about that, not to make vows and oaths and things like that, but let your yes be yes and no be no. Verse 30 says, And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Verse 33, And he struck them from Arar, the neighborhood of Mineth, twenty cities he conquered as far as Abel Kiramim, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Here's the crazy part. Verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes. Why did he rip his clothes? Why did he tear his clothes? Yeah. Why does he have to do that? Yeah. So alas, my daughter, he says, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And so he tells her of this vow that he made. And in this remarkable account here, she's accepting of it and says, you made a vow. You've got to fulfill it. And she asked for some time uh, to, to celebrate with her friends and then that she would come back and that he would 
uh, fulfill this vow that he made to, to the Lord. And so, as I look at the clock and I see it's closing time, this is an awkward place to close, <laughs> as we generally go like, hey, what's some application from this? <laughs> uh, but let's do it. This is God's word. This is in God's word. Um, so let's discuss it. Perhaps some of you, this is the first time you've heard this account. And so let me just throw it out there to say, what is happening here? What, what are you talking about? He's got it. What are you talking about? That he's going to kill his daughter? I mean, is, is killing your daughter or something that God wants you to do? So let's have a little five-minute big boy deep into the pool wrestling session. Well, you didn't, you didn't want him to make the deal anyway. He made the deal, and that's the consequence of it. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 what he did. The consequence is he didn't kill his daughter. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess since we're on, we're on faith, I mean, if he had enough faith, he wouldn't have had to make the vow. Or, and that was... Him making the vow just shows that he was lacking in faith. Mm. Possibly, right? Yeah, and kind of like, uh, kind of like Barak saying, like, "No, I won't go unless this woman goes with me." Okay. Any other thoughts? Kind of like an exchange. You give me this, and I'll give you that. Yeah, and certainly probably, you know, probably didn't do it in a flippant manner. You know, I think vows and oaths, but I think a lot of them would make them back then. But obviously he's probably thinking, you know, the first thing he sees when he gets home is going to be a sheep or a lamb or some kind of animal out, out, out in the house, out in the field. Uh, and lo and behold, this happened. Okay, what else do we think? Any other insights? Into, you know, anything we've talked about tonight. Application. Faith. Or just about this story here. Do you have any, uh, I don't know if you have any insights or thoughts on, on that? You know, to expound more on vows and oaths. And, you know, like I said, we, we did study that in James. Yeah, and it could be that his following through with this vow was a sin. You know, maybe his pride caused him to say, yeah, I'm not going to go back. Instead of saying, no, I was wrong. I'm an idiot. Why would I kill my own daughter? Mm -hmm. I'm a stupid, proud man. And so I I would say, no, the Lord doesn't approve of this. No, this is not what the Lord asked in return for the victory. This is... This is all on him. This is sin. It's not to be repeated or modeled in any way. That's right. But to our point, from every other example, there is this sense of encouragement that God saves sinners. And even those who are mentioned in the Hall of Faith, you know, we are all terrible, broken, this side of heaven. And need Jesus. Amen. And the best of us can become the worst of us tomorrow. And that doesn't mean you're not saved. It it means you're a frail, imperfect, remaining sin, human, this side of heaven. Yeah. And but it is a motivation to say, Lord Jesus, let me walk close with you so that I don't do something stupid like my brothers who have gone before me. Because clearly we're all capable of being stupid. Yet, as we listed some of the laundry lists earlier, you know, just you guys know them as we go down. Noah, Moses, Abraham, right? We we know the stupidity uh, that Brian's talking about because it's listed. David, right? We're going to get to him next week. Yeah.